are together again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are here because we love Jesus. Amen. We love him because he loved us first. Amen. Amen. So we are here to offer him thanksgiving, praise, worship. Have you come prepared? We want the presence of God to be here. Amen. We want to commit our meeting into his hands. We want the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, glory be to your name. You are the glorious, the eternal, the almighty God. Swami no Bhutama Swami ni Sada Kali Bhu Yogi Ma Swami ni Mahimwani Tu Diviya Nasi. You are the one who sits on the throne and everything is under your feet. Swami no Bhutama Swami ni Abhu Ke Siddhi Na U Diviya Nasi. Swami ni Yogi Ma Swami ni Sama Diva Pali Na Bhutama Swami Dai Te Na Swami. And we come before you washed in the blood of Jesus. Swami ni Abhu Bhutama Swami ni Asti Na Pemeni Jisna Swami ni Mukada Biya Sa Swami Sige Rudri. We want to give thanks, we want to give praise, we want to give worship to you. Swami Nabhubhuan says, Tuti Prasant Swami, Magiva Namaskar, Vajra Girino Swami. Lord, we ask you our presence to fill this place. Swami Nabhubhuan says, Mahi Me Nabhubhuan says, Yabhi Mukhi Me Vistani Pirendena Swami. Lord, we come as empty vessels to be filled by you. Swami api hissu bajan lesa kamina sitna Swami nabhuan segi piri tiri yasa Swami. We come as needy people that you will take care of our needs. Swami api yavashadavyan saita mini suvide dagla sitna Swami nabhuan segi api yavashadavyan denagana eva bhuan segi karanda yasa Swami. We come to offer to you. Swami nabhuan segi prasamsa vana vashkara ek dinbe na Swami. We come to offer to you. Swami nabhuan segi prasamsa vana vashkara ek dinbe na Swami. We offer ourselves to you. Swami ni api apu apu ki apu buan siya ita asti na baare karna Swami. Lord, lead us by your Holy Spirit. Swami ni apu buan siya ki shuddhat pen hoa ka pennu menna Swami. We want the name of Jesus to be glorified. Swami ni apu da vashivan ni Yesu shena nami mai meera pat kiri pae Swami. Amen, Amen, Amen. Okay, let us clap to the Lord. Nothing is impossible for him. Nothing is too hard for him. He can change impossible situations. He can do miracles today. He can do miracles today. He can heal today. He can set people free today. And we rejoice because this is our God. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always exciting for me to worship with you because I love to see your passion and your love for Jesus. And this idea of passion and love for Jesus is going to be what I want to talk about this morning. If you were here last week, I believe your pastor taught about one very important verse in the Bible. This verse is a verse that has a recipe for revival. It's 2nd Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. Now, I'm not going to talk about that this morning, but I wanted to read it before we began. Second Chronicles 714. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, there are many examples in the Bible of this verse coming true. There are many examples in life, in modern day life, of this happening as well. Now, one example in the Bible we find happened very close to this area where we live now. In a city called Ephesus, that was that is in modern day Turkey, we see a revival happen. Now you don't have to turn in your Bibles, but in Acts chapter 19, it talks about when Paul visited Ephesus for the first time. The Bible says that Paul, when he was there, that he would enter into the Jewish synagogue and Jewish temple and he would teach the people about God, about the Lord. Jesus. For three months he was teaching the people every day, arguing and trying to convince them about the truth of Jesus. But the people did not want to listen. So every day he began to take disciples with him to uh, talk more about and have discussions about uh, about Jesus. 
And Paul was faithful to teach for two years so that almost everyone in this area heard about the Lord Jesus. And God was doing miracles at this time, amazing miracles where even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched Paul were taken to sick people and they're either they were made they were healed and evil spirits were free now some of the people who didn't believe in Jesus, some of the Jews saw this happening and they wanted to do the same thing. And there was one priest, he had seven sons. And these, these men were going and they were trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus even though they did not believe. One day they went to a man who was evil who was possessed by an evil spirit. And they said in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And the evil spirit looked at these men, spoke back to these men and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man with the evil spirit beat up these seven men and they had to run out of the house completely naked. You can imagine this story spread around the area and many people became afraid and began to honor the name of Jesus. And many of the people who started to believe in Jesus came out and started to profess, I believe in, in Jesus. And the people who worshipped evil spirits and worshipped demons, they took their um, their scrolls and their idols and they came out and they broke them and they burned them. And the Bible says that when this happened, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. It's like a picture of that verse we read in Second Chronicles that when the people called by God's name would pray and seek and turn against their wicked ways, that he would heal them. But that also is not exactly what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about what happened about 40 years later. About 40 years later, 
there was a man named John, the disciple John. This is John who wrote the Gospel of John and the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. This is the same person. And he was sent as an exile to the island of Patmos. Because, so John was sent to an island. Uh, and it was on this island that he received the revelation of Jesus Christ that we read in, Revel in the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation. It's the last book in your Bible to chapter 2. Now, did you know that Jesus wrote letters in the Bible? Now, we know that this is God's word, but there are some letters that Jesus wrote in the Bible. The Bible. And specifically, Jesus sends letters to seven churches in this area of the world, and, to, and one of the churches was Ephesus. Imagine for a moment, what if Jesus wrote you a letter directly? What do you think it would say? So what I'd like to do for our next few minutes we have together is talk about the letter that was sent to this church and what it means for us in the theme of revival. Okay, so Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So, it says that this letter is written to an angel. Now, the Bible mentions angels many times, but many scholars, and I believe this as well, that here the angel refers to the messenger, which refers to the pastor of the church. And in all of Jesus' letters, they all follow the same pattern. And he starts off the letters talking about who it's to, and then he describes himself. And this is how Jesus describes himself. He says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, what does this mean? Well, we can understand what it means because we look at the Bible to help us interpret it. And in the chapter before, it says that the seven stars are the seven angels or the seven messengers, the seven pastors of these seven churches. And the seven lampstands, these represent the churches. 
And it says that Jesus holds them, the pastors, in his hand. And Jesus says he walks among the churches. This is really important for us to remember that Jesus, he is all powerful, he is all in control, he is the shepherd, he is the one who holds, Brother George, who holds you. In his hands. And it says that Jesus walks among the church. Think about that, that he walks among us. He is, he is listening to your worship team. He is analyzing the message that I'm sharing. Um, does it honor his word or not? He's in our midst even now. Every time we meet, we need to have this understanding in our minds that Jesus is in our midst. Okay, so we're, we're reading a letter that Jesus wrote to a church, a church that had a revival before, and what is he going to say to them? First, he starts with some good things. Verse 2. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Verse 3. You have, pre you have persevered, and you have endured hardships for my name, and not grown weary. So Jesus recognizes their hard work. He recognizes that they are serving at every opportunity. He recognizes their endurance and that they are facing opposition. You know, in this time, this place, it was a place of great worship of idols and false teaching and evil spirits. It was the center for worshiping a god named Artemis or Diana as the Romans would say. And uh, there was huge temple, one of the most amazing architectural wonders of the world that was in this place. And because of all of these evil things and evil spirits, I mean, we know that there were evil people trying to come into the church and bring false teaching. But Jesus, he sees the church and he sees this church and he says, you're a church that hates evil and hates false teaching. That's really good. 
He says that you tested false teachers, and if they were false, you rejected them. It's important for us to remember this, that not everyone who tries to come and to teach us in Jesus' name is actually a follower of Christ. We must be careful. We must analyze the teachings and the things that we hear against what God says in His Word. But then in verse 4, he shares one thing that is a complaint, something he has against them. And unfortunately, this verse is what this letter is known for. This is what Jesus said. He said, Yet... I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Remember the love that these people had for Jesus in the beginning? They were running into the streets and burning their valuable idols and scrolls. And now it seems like they're continuing to serve faithfully, but they're just going through the motions. Now, let me encourage you because when I worship with you this morning, I see a passion and a love for Jesus that he's talking about. You know, loving the Lord Jesus is at the core of the saving relationship that we have with him. This is not a new idea for the Christian. Remember, Jesus said, Whoever loves his mother and father more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus said, Whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy than me. Remember what Jesus said to Peter three times after he rose from the dead. He said, Peter, do you love me? Those who say they are Christians love the Lord Jesus. You know, when I, when I think about this verse, where Jesus says you've abandoned the love that you had at first, I often think about human relationships. Let me tell you a love story. It's a very romantic love story. When I was 16 years old, I saw a girl and I fell in love. This girl was so beautiful that I could not keep my eyes off of her. 
I would watch her, and when she would look at me, I would turn my head, but then when she looked away, I would look again. Now, I didn't know that she also liked me. <laughs> Later, she told me that the first time she saw me, she said to her friend, I'm going to marry him. <laughs> Now, we fell in love. And we talked, but we met each other only for one week, but we lived a long ways away from each other. We live 2,000 kilometers apart from each other. But we talked on the telephone. And we did not have uh, cell phones um, back then. Yeah, we didn't have a mobile phone. But we, we wrote letters. And one day, I married her. And we remained in love. And God allowed us to have children. And we remained in love. Now imagine, imagine one day my wife comes to me and says to me, I don't love you anymore. Imagine if she came to me and said, I do not love you anymore. I'm going to be your wife. I will cook for you. I will talk to you. I will work. I will spend time with you. But I do not love you. How should I feel? I can tell you I would be devastated. I would be just broken. I don't love you, but nothing will change. I would never want that. And thankfully that never happened. <laughs> but can you imagine that that's kind of like what the Lord is saying to the church in Ephesus? You know, they're like, Lord, we don't love you like we used to. We will do the motions. We will still go to church. We will still serve. We will still do this. But our love is not there. And that's not what he wants. He doesn't want us to, to work hard and to sing songs of worship and to still believe but not to love. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, we know our level of love for the Lord Jesus. But let me share with you a few things that happen when we start to lose our love. Number one, we become more concerned with knowledge than holiness. 
एक निशा आपे प्रज्ञा और माता पर रंगा सीखी ने वा उन्हाँ से तुल शुद्ध वंजीव शुद्ध कमीन सीखी ने तो आपे मानस तुल आपे बीड़ा सीखी ने वा Another thing that can happen is that we lose our desire to share Christ with others because we see the world as an enemy instead of a mission field. Another thing that happens when we start to lose our love is that we lose our sensitivity to the holy spirit because we allow sins into our life another thing is that we become content with who we are instead of desiring to be more like Jesus we begin to love something or someone else more than we love Jesus. Now remember, this is Jesus' letter to the church in Ephesus. And Jesus is so good and he is so loving that he does not say, oh, you're so bad, but he tells them what they should do. Verse 5, Jesus says, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Think of a fire that's burning really hot and then after a while when it's left unattended it starts to go away and all that's left are a few little embers. Jesus' first suggestion is to remember. Remember what it was like before. So he tells us to uh, remember what he's done for us, to fan the flame in our hearts. He says to repent. This is literally... An urgent appeal by Jesus for an immediate change in attitude, in direction for what they're doing. And Jesus talks about um, renewing their life. He says, do the things that you did at first. Sometimes in the Christian life, and I am guilty of this as well, that we try to replace loving God with serving God. When, when Jesus calls us to himself and when he saves us, we find ourselves so excited about our relationship with him that we want to spend time with him. We want to learn from him. We want to be like him. But 
We want to serve Him as well. We cannot get enough. We want to share Him with everyone. This is how it feels when we have an encounter with Jesus. But oftentimes what happens is we begin to neglect our relationship with Jesus and we begin to focus on the, the serving and the doing the things. These are good things, but we begin to do them more for ourselves than we do for Him. And he gives a warning. He says, if you do not change, I will remove the lampstand. He's basically saying, I will remove the church. Unfortunately, there are many churches who have lost their light for Jesus. Maybe they're still meeting, but there's no joy, there's no praise, there's no conviction, there's no truth. Let's read the next two verses. But you have this in your favor, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious and overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. Okay, so Jesus briefly mentions another good thing they did. They do not like the teachings of the Nicolaitans. This was a sect that we see in later parts of Jesus' letters that has invaded the church with false teaching. So again, Jesus says it's really good that you avoid false teaching and that you cling to the truth. And then he ends the letter with a promise. He says to the person who overcomes... I will grant to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. He says to the person who overcomes. Who is the person who overcomes? Well, we know from scripture that John says that in, you don't have to turn here, but First John 5, he says that whoever is born of God overcomes. So, the overcomer is the Christian. So Jesus is saying to the true believers, to the true Christians, I give you this promise. Alright, so what should we learn from this this morning? The first thing is, be certain that you are a true follower of Christ. <coughs> the second thing is be certain to maintain 
Remember, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and tired, and I will give you rest. And do you know why we should love Jesus? Why should we love him? Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. Let this be the truth that fuels the fire of revival in our lives. That God loves you. That God looked upon you and me and Brother George and every other person and he saw our helplessness. But he did not leave us. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And by trusting in Christ, by faith in the name of Jesus, we sang no other name in the name of Jesus that you will be saved. Thank you for listening this morning. I encourage you to continue to fall in love with God and His Word. And if by chance there's anyone here this morning who has not surrendered their life to Jesus for the first time, don't leave here today without coming to talk to Brother George or myself. We'd love to pray for you. And for the rest of us, we are praying. Pray for me as well, that we might daily fall deeply in love with Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for this letter that you sent to the church in Ephesus. Thank you that you call us your servants. That you call us your children. That you even call us friend. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you this morning. We confess that we need more of you in our lives. Lord, we confess that we need more of you in our Swami Nasa, Apime Ivasil, Nihano obeyed the Titino Api Hadavatun in Swamini. Apadesa Balala Swami Nasa, Apake Hadavate, Godanagan known as Tana Swami Nasa, Godanagu man of Swamini. Lord, we love you. Swamini Api Vadadre, may you receive all glory. It's Silu Maime of Hansi Tamakamineva. Help us to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.